first, uh, the most important thing is actually to define uh, what uh, is the context that we live in. And I would like to ask a question to uh, Robert Asberges. Since 2006, you were uh, one of the first people to, um, uh, to highlight the dreadful uh, trends of our, our, and our demographic situation. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, many of your, let's say, prognoses came true. How do you see our cities in the next 10 years? And uh, what is your vision? The pessimistic one and the optimistic one. Sorry for my colleagues, I will speak in Lithuania, okay? <laughs> Lithuanian language, I mean, because auditory mainly is Lithuanian. Okay. Tai ačiū labai jums priklausimą. Iš tikrųjų, kada mes pradėjom galvoti apie urbanistinį forumą ir iš esmės pradėjom galvoti apie tai, kaip keisis mūsų miestai, tai buvo nekilnomo turto vystytojų noras, pabandyti spėti, kaip keisis miestai ir kokių produktų reikės miestuose, kaip jie atrodys. Ir tada ačiū labai dar daliai Bardauskiai, nei pataisė mane dalia buvo irgi viena iš mūsų iniciatorių dėl urbanistinių forumų, kai mes pradėjom daryti analizės, kaip atrodo mūsų demografinė situacija ir pradėjom daryti spėjimus, kaip vystysis Lietuvą. Tai pirmą kartą aš pabilau apie demografinės problemės būtent, kaip teisingai pasakė, 2006 metais, kada jos dar nebuvo tokios aštrios. Ir mes pamatėm, kad pagal gimimų skaičių, pagal migracijos e, kiekius ir skaičius Lietuva stipriai trauksis. Ir mes priešingai tam, ką kalbėjo Aleksandra apie Afrikos miestus, apie Azijos miestus, kurie stipriai auga, mes turėjom galvoti visiškai priešingas idėjas, kaip planingai trauktis miestams, kaip suvaldyti jų mažėjimą, kaip suvaldyti socialinės problemas dėl to, kad mes turim didžiulį dar ir demografinį pokytį, kad mažėjam iš esmės, bet mums mažėja jaunų žmonių, senų žmonių skaičius nemažėja, o santykinai net didėja, jeigu mes lyginsim jų skaičių mieste. Taigi, problemos yra visiškai kitos. Bet dabar mes, jeigu galvojam apie Jeigu mes tada galvojom tik tai apie žmonės iš esmės ir kaip mes suvaldysim miestų traukimasi, dabar prisidėjo dar vieni labai rimti faktoriai, tai būtent ketvirtoji pramoninė revoliucija, apie ką aš jau truputėlį kalbėjau ir žanginiai kalboj. Kaip atrodys miestai, kada gamyboj vis bus mažiau žimtų žmonių, kada prekyboj vis bus mažiau žimtų žmonių, kada, sakykim, Nemaža dalis reikia pripažinti darbo vietų, ypatingai iš vidurinio sluoksnio stipriai apmažės ir palies netgi e, tokias atrodo įprastas mum darbo vietas kaip buhalterija, kaip teisininkai, čia irgi skaičius mažės. Kuo užsijim žmonės? Ir iš esmės tai turbūt yra klausimas e, mum visiem. Ta prasme, kad e, kas bus tas žmonių kūrybingo potencialo išnaudojimas mieste. Ir tam aš matau, kad priešingai tam, ką kalbėjo aplinkos ministerijos žmonės pradžioje savo pranešimuose, aš manau, kad iš esmės reikia keisti politikų supratimą apie tai, kas gali šiandien stabilizuoti situaciją Lietuvoje. Be bejonės, kad tą gali padaryti tik tai stipri savivaldo ir stipri lyderystė savivaldo. Aš esu absoliučiai dėl to įsitikinęs. Dėl to, kad jeigu žmonės patys reiškia, bus įtraukti į savo ateities kūrimą, aš turiu žmonės mieste, kurie galvos, kas gali būti jų stiprioji pusė, kaip tą miesto e, patrauklumą didinti. E, turbūt aš atsiprašau, nebuvau daly pranešimų, kada vyko urbanistis formas, bet tą, ką man pačiam tenka e, skaityti ir gilintis, kaip keičiasi pasaulis, e, tą, ką ir Aleksandra pabrėžė savo pranešimuose, kad didėja, konglomeratai, didėja stambėjai miestai, tai apie tai buvo kalbėta ir Kanuose vykusiame pavasarį nekilnomų turto forume, kad iš esmės yra spėjimas, kad 50 metais pasaulį valdys ne 220 valstybių, bet 50 didžiausių miestų, kurie bus iš esmės 
traukos objektai, magnetai, kuriuos tekės kapitalas, žmogiškasis kapitalas, technologijos ir, ir, ir iškia, keisis suvokimas apie tą, sakykime, valstybę kaip apie darinį ir miestas bus tas darinys, kuris užtikrins žmogaus kokybišką gyvenimą. Ką tai reiškia? Tam reikia ruoštis be abejonės. Ar Lietuva turi savo kryptį ir kelią? Ir taip ir ne. Jeigu mes nieko nedarysim, tai be abejonės magnintai nudrenuos lietuvišką jaunimą, lietuvišką protą ir iš esmės mes liksim vėl tik tai socialinės atskirties mažinimo diskusijų įkaitais. Ir daugiau nieko. Bet kita vertus, jeigu mes išryškinsim savo stipresias pusės, aš turiu omeny visų pirma, žiūrėsim, kuo stiprus yra miestas. Savo gamybą, savo, savo paslaugomis, tarkim, savo gamta, savo kultūra. Tai yra tos stiprios pusės, kos gali, sakykim, būti tie židiniai miesto augimui. Bet nuo to, kaip tas augimas atrodys, be abejonės, tai yra visų pirma miesto bendruomenės ir miesto lyderių klausimas. Nes dar viena įdomi apklausa, kurią man teko skaityti visiškai nesenai, padaryta jinai beje ir aš šių metų vasaros pradžioje, kaip jaunimas mato savo ateitį. Ir tai turbūt apsprendžia iš esmės diskusijų lauką ir tai, ką mums reikėtų daryti. Taigi, apklausta buvo beveik 32 tūkstančių jaunimo visuose penkiuose kontinentuose. Ir kokie yra bendri dalykai. Jaunimas priešingai mūsų supratimui apie nacionalinės vertybės, apie nacionalinį identitetą. Pirmoji leibė, 41 procentas jaunimo skaito, kad jie yra pasaulio piliečiai. Kitaip tariant, ką aš esu nekartą sakęs, pasaulis mažėja, globalumas didėja ir išmė žmonės pradeda jaustis pasaulio piliečiai. Dėl to, kad ryšys ypatingai internetinis ryšys mūsų labai suartino, mes ne, mūsų draugai yra visuose kontinentuose, mes visi bendravom ir atrodo, kad jie čia šaliai yra, plus kelionės, lėktuvai suartino, dabar mano pažįstami dirba Oslė, Londone, grįžti savo atgalį į Lietuvą, dvi vandos kryžio, tai yra atrodo čia pat, viskas čia pat yra, čia kaip normaliai paėjimus, tai beveik toj pačioj valstybėje visi gyvenam. Taigi identitetas keičiasi ir reiškia, žmogus jaučiasi globalus. Kitas dalykas, kada paklausė jaunimą, ar jūs keistumėt savo šalį dėl karjeros, dėl savo ateities, 80 procentų jaunimo pasakė, kad taip. Ir tai yra vidurkis visuose penkiuose kontinentuose. Tai reiškia, jaunimo e, pritraukimas, atraktyvumas arba miesto ateitis absoliučiai priklauso nuo to, kad miestas tampa magnetų tam jaunam žmogui dirbti, kurti, gyventi. Ir čia, man atrodo, labai klausimas yra, kaip mes tą išnaudosim. Tai bus ir atsakymas, kokie Lietuvos miestai bus ateityje. Ačiū labai. Uh, thank you very much. And then uh, the next logical question is actually to Aleksandra. And um, I saw one very funny thing on your presentation. It is uh, like a really worked up man. And then... Um, uh, there's something like a message coming from uh, outside the door. Can we complete the global agenda by lunchtime? <laughs> and uh, so the question is, uh, even though your, your main expertise uh, is about the rapidly globalizing regions uh, in a uh, uh, global south, let's say, what kind of policies are transferable to the, let's say, shrinking regions? Like uh, I'm talking, of course, about uh, our country and uh, the other shrinking regions all around Europe. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much uh, for the question. Yeah, I think I was thinking about the question exactly, uh, knowing also uh, what we're going to present here from, from the Global South. Um, so I think one aspect which I learned now, uh, which is not policy, but it's actually to have a broad understanding also how cities work. So that will be first also my entry point. I worked also a couple of years, three years in Ukraine, but just actually to understand, so we know cities are the problems and cities are the solution at the same time. So we are in this conflict. So, but we have to understand actually in which uh, area and that's uh, mandates are they uh, moving themselves. That's what I tried actually to explain here as well. So we put a, a lot of pressure of them as well, but do they have actually the instruments uh, they need to actually act and to be more in the forefront um, to, to confront the challenges. 
be shrinking or not shrinking. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Yeah, but actually, that I think is one important aspect, and there comes very strongly the political economy uh, um, and the political interest as well uh, to devote uh, powers to, to to local authorities. I think another aspect which is also important, uh, and I can say it from my my personal background. So my husband works at the local authority. He is a, a director of uh, public health. Uh, in managing 70 persons, but actually it's not a prestige work. Uh, see, he worked before at the UN and everybody was so, oh, UN, that's very good. He changed then to the local authority and actually it's not really very rec recognized. Yeah, you, lo you only work at the local authority. So I think also from our understanding here and also from the national government to give the recognition uh, to those uh, who are uh, employees uh, at the municipal level. I think another uh, aspect is which we are trying to uh, foster as well in, in different countries is to understand the system of cities, exactly as I also tried to mention. So once cities are growing, other areas are shrinking. So it can be the rural area which is shrinking or cities which have already the infrastructure which are shrinking. But um, actually to have a policy which tries to understand this rural-urban continuum how actually the bigger cities depend also on the resources from the smaller cities and to have an understanding also um, how the uh, a system of cities work, uh, how can we try to foster uh, economic, equitable economic growth uh, in different uh, regions and only not to have one, one hub. We also mentioned as well, for example, local authorities could try to promote uh, different alternative, innovative uh, aspects to promote uh, um, jobs. We have a lot of youth in different cities, but we have to see what kind of jobs can we offer them to stay. So, for example, with public procurement with one specific conditions, and we heard it as well, it's to include the, the um, uh, local expertise from, from those cities. So there are initiatives which can uh, foster uh, or make also smaller cities uh, more attractive. And I think, uh, and you just mentioned it, the most important thing is to, pour, uh, to put also civil society on the forefront. So once I as a citizen identify myself that I'm from the region, I have actually a voice to say, and I actually also encourage to be part of planning process of decisions, this also helps actually to be uh, for making one city or one region more, more attractive. Okay, now let's go back one scale uh, to the bottom, yeah? And um, Joost, you put it brilliantly that we actually should focus not on a, on a building, but on a result, what that building is. And um, uh, my question is, um, um, how do you create an incentives for the civic innovation? in the governmental institutions? Um, I think the, the biggest incentive is the context that, that you just described. Um, we're at a situation, and you're at a situation, where um, there's a rapidly shifting urban and societal context which does uh, potentially pose threats. I think uh, the, the existing context of, of uh, partial depopulation is one, uh, obviously is inequality issues, then there is the fourth industrial revolution. Those are the meta trends. And one of the things that's clear is that the impact that they have on places is highly differential. And what tends to be the case, and I'm not a particular genius for mentioning this, I think it's fairly well understood, is that uh, some cities are winners, some cities are losers. Big cities tend to win, that's one thing, but there's also a role for smaller places, and one of the absolute differentiating factors is place quality, right? And place quality is a curious thing, right? It, it used to be something that architects and landscape architects and planners thought they could deliver, right? more beautiful, better planned places. Now, we know that planners and architects and designers play a role, but just as important as the physical quality of a place, it's also the stories and the narratives that come from a place. Right? And those tend to be stories of people and their entrepreneurship and the networks they make. 
and the culture they enjoy and the new things happening. Right? That's what drives whether a place feels good about itself or not. Right? And that is not something, something that planners and designers can deliver on their own. They try, right? but the Guggenheim effect in Bilbao has more or less uh, been, been done. Right? And there's only so many Guggenheims we can have. So, so then what do you have? Let me give you an example. There's a small town north of Manchester. It's called Todmorden. It's really very small. It was a declining post-industrial rural town. Fairly beautiful setting, nice buildings, nothing going on. Until two ladies started what seemed like a very anarchistic, weird initiative to plant trees, uh, fruit trees and vegetables in public spaces. And they got some neighbors to work with them and they organized some events. It was like an open invite, everyone could take part. And all of a sudden, 10 years later, this town has changed, right? So not only is now the hospital taking part, the police station has vegetables growing in front of it. There's apple trees at the railway station. Uh, the health centers are taking part. Everyone's taking part. There's now tourists coming to that town to watch the vegetables grow. Right? It seems silly, right? But this place has changed. Young families are moving there because, well, it's fun to be there with your neighbors and, and to hang around in the street in the weekend uh, 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 and, and tend the gardens. Um, there's now food startups. Young people are starting businesses there. This is something that decades of economic development planning was not able to achieve. Right? No amount of real estate investment on its own could have achieved that. It's the story of a place that's changed because of seemingly anarchistic marginal actions by a few citizens. Right? It's those kind of dynamics that change places. And I think what, what we have to be careful talking amongst planners and designers is that we don't focus too much on participation as in participative processes. Yes, people like to have a say about plans, right? They want to be involved in decision making, but actually, really, people just want to do things and be able and encouraged to be doing things. So let's focus less on participative processes, more on participative products the stuff that citizens can make. And I think the fourth industrial revolution actually gives us these tools um, and understandings much stronger. But the question, of course, is who owns the fourth industrial revolution? There's a big difference between digital technology owned only by large companies or digital technology, think about renewable energy, think about CNC manufacturing, uh, local manufacturing, owned by local entrepreneurs or by citizens. And I think those are some of the defining factors. So actually, I'm very optimistic about the prospects of smaller places. I think as everyone moves to bigger cities, and I live in London, I know what it's like, they're very stressful, right? If you can integrate small places and the countryside in the urban system through very fast broadband and good quality places, where people from larger cities can also connect, visit, spend some time maybe, spend half, uh, spend half a year uh, working on very particular projects together with your young family as opposed to living in a city where childcare is too expensive and everyone is stressed out. Right? Then I think smaller places can grow, but only if they have their own identity, only if citizens are involved in the creation of the, of the narratives and the stories that come out of these places. And that is civic innovation. And so if you're um, the mayor of a small town, if you're a planner, you have every incentive to focus on that civic innovation. Because civic innovation, it's not just civic society, it's civic entrepreneurship will drive economic growth and well-being. Thank you very much. And uh, now the next logical question. <laughs> Somehow it, like, uh, it, it, it uh, rolls uh, very naturally in this discussion. Uh, talking about all the initiatives and all the uh, uh, wonderful and inspiring examples that you showed uh, in your uh, presentation, there's always a question uh, how we can have more of that. Yeah? And as Joost put it, there's just, let's say, one Guggenheim and, and uh, maybe copying it is not the best idea. So uh, is there some kind of a recipe uh, to upscale it or is just uh, pure luck? Is there a way to be more sure that these initiatives uh, eventually uh, like become uh, maybe a national or regional scale kind of bodies? 
it's, it's a difficult question. I think there's a lot of <coughs> incentives across Europe to help transferring good practices, but there's always a trick there, no? Because obviously cities have different contexts. You have to adapt tools and policies and frameworks into local uh, conditions, and, and this might completely change the whole point. So I think the most important, as you said, is to understand what is already happening in a city, ha to map innovation outside the municipality, and, and to, to find ways to enable it instead of blocking it, like what I showed in Athens, no? The whole um, innovative idea of the Athens municipality is coming from recognizing that there are a lot of valuable things there we didn't know. They're important for the city, we should help them, but most of our regulations block them. So if we would follow our regu regulations, all of them would be illegal. This is what they found, they mapped 600 initiatives, 596 was illegal, four was legal. So if you want to create innovation outside the municipality, you have to understand how to make, be more flexible without actually obviously allowing space for corruption and uh, abuse of flexibility. And this brings in the whole question of, of innovation within a municipality. We see a lot of attempts, for example, also small towns, big towns, uh, in a way forcing their municipal officers to go out and spend, I don't know, 20% of their time outside the offices to visit initiatives, visit people, to be in touch with, with the reality. Other incentives creating, uh, let's say, spaces where different departments come together because that's usually a very big issue that when I work with the uh, real estate um, or urban planning department of the city of Rome uh, on real estate things, but the real estate department has its own agenda and does completely different things, so there's no communication between them. So this is a big challenge, how you create communication within an organization and then how do you go out of the organization and create contacts with, with, uh, with people outside. And the other thing, when we, when we think of, of uh, the whole question of youth giving voice to some groups of the population, um, I think it's very important, as, as we heard as well, to, um, to hear what people need, what, the, what young people need. And um, what we saw, for example, there's also a lot of, lot of in interesting inno innovation that can be transferred or not, depending on the context. For example, the city of Helsinki created a youth council that is actually teenagers, 20 teenagers are elected every year to represent youth in the city and they will advise the city on what young people need. And this can be very, often very stupid things like they vote for, uh, they want a, a little supermarket in this neighborhood, which is from policy viewpoint, maybe it's not a priority. This is what they want, okay. This can be a matter of education. But there are a lot of things that are actually, uh, in a way, enable them to create a sense of ownership that this is their city and they, they have a place in the city. So in the long term, they will be attached to the city and they learn that they can contribute to decision making. And I think this is very important, especially in, uh, in Eastern Europe, where I'm from as well. But I understand that there's very little trust between public and civic and private sector. Um, there's very little confidence among the population in, in politics very often. So I think we need to recreate these links and these bonds, otherwise it's very hard to work together. Thank you very much. Um, from uh, your answer, I, I uh, see some very important, uh, let's say, words. Uh, it came up a couple of times that uh, like communication is one of the most essential things and a proper transfer, uh, transfer of knowledge and then just sharing uh, everything that is around. Um, I would like to direct another question to the Mr. Ambassador. And uh, since Dutch embassy, embassy is the, uh, the biggest importer of uh, knowledge on sustainable urban mobility, and uh, you personally contributed uh, a lot to the creation of sustainable uh, urban mobility plans and then uh, also to the uh, quality of the content. I just want to ask, so how's it going? What kind of, what kind of um, uh, thresholds uh, you <laughs> experienced? What could be better? What is not as smooth? And uh, what would be re recommendations for the, our maybe politicians, mayors, and uh, the general public? Um, 
it's, it's, I, I think it's a point of uh, departure which you have to revisit. Because uh, if you're asking what kind of problems are there, are there things to improve, actually you should start with what is already going well. Um, this uh, creates a sense of optimism of things like you, you can do things, you can actually uh, achieve uh, with individual uh, efforts uh, amazing results and they are already here. Uh, and the, the only thing we are trying to do is to uh, play open card as we say and uh, look for possibilities to uh, change, exchange uh, experiences which have proven to be uh, effective in, in our situation, but not necessarily here in Lithuania. Um, but to give you an example, which is uh, fairly well known, I suppose, in, I'm very much impressed with what's happening in the Loftas, uh, which is an industrial area, uh, a building which has a multifunctional um, attitude, so to speak. Uh, and it's uh, creating a lot of dynamism. It reminds me of the um, the ruin bars in Budapest. Uh, we had just had a talk about it uh, briefly. Uh, my previous posting was in Budapest. Uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, local initiatives actually in Budapest, in that, that example, creates um, tourism because people want to see them. Uh, if you look at the programming in, um, let's say, Konas, where you also have, uh, uh, let's say, a startup. Uh, common uh, work area somewhere on the fourth floor in the Leishvalea. This is something which is already happening. Uh, and the, the one thing I think we should do is to uh, link those positive uh, elements into something which we could use as a narrative for the, um, for the dialogue with the various uh, stakeholders uh, which are um, already there. Um, we have been talking yesterday even already with the uh, uh, municipal or authorities of uh, Vilnius to take things further. Uh, we are currently working on uh, creating, let's say, a practical uh, implementation of what we have uh, agreed upon in Amsterdam last year. Um, we are trying to follow a logical line uh, in which we facilitate, we do not dictate, we facilitate making uh, it possible for uh, people to meet each other, to, uh, to get ideas uh, about what is coming in the future. If you allow me uh, just another example, two weeks ago the Lithuanian Road Administration and the Ministry of Transport together with uh, other experts went to the Netherlands uh, because they asked us to, uh, to do that. So there was actually a concrete question from the Minister of Transport, uh, Mr. Minister Masulis, take us down to the road of what is going to happen with autonomous vehicles. In about half a generation's time, um, private car ownership will have dropped dramatically. Uh, the way we move around the city is going to change dramatically. Um, the way we uh, use the Internet of Things is going to change our way of life dramatically. Uh, but it's not a drama. Uh, it is something which is... Uh, <laughs> it's, well, there you go. It, it, it is, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, look at, at the positive uh, elements where uh, you can actually uh, take, take some of the examples which you already have seen on board uh, from other uh, countries. Um, I've seen examples in Greece, in Bulgaria, um, uh, also in Poland. Actually, we have uh, introduced urbanists, uh, Dutch urbanists who have worked in and are working in Poland and in Hungary. Uh, to Lithuania because of the, let's say, the parallel issues which are at stake. So we're trying to connect uh, knowledge uh, with the actual situation here. And uh, as we were talking about the, um, decentralization and also deregulation, I'm certainly hoping, and we're talking uh, at this moment uh, also with the uh, Prime Minister's office, uh, to, um, uh, together with the uh, Confederation of Industries, we hope, uh, to, to have a specific issue on how to de deregulate, how to decrease administrative burdens, but it also would apply for these kind of initiatives, how to make people free and make, uh, make them own their city again. Thank you very much. Uh, there are two microphones uh, on one corner and then the other one. 
of the, sta of the, of the stage. Maybe we have some questions. Do we have anyone? Yes? Yes, please. So I will address it in English. So I, I, I'm quite struck with, uh, with all the discussion because it's really not, uh, no longer about the actual problems that we're facing, but we're already kind of thinking about the solutions. And I'm very happy that international experts are already offering uh, storytelling narratives and how to actually uh, try to take the first steps towards the real context and real communication between interdisciplinary actors. So my question is, uh, what are actually the real, real first steps, let's say, for institutional workers to start from? Is it a roadmap? Is it uh, an institutional reading of urban agenda? Because a lot of us were actually quoting and citing, but not really knowing fully the context. What are your advice to, let's say, our Lithuanian community? <laughs> Thank you. It's for address for international experts. Thank you very much for the question. I can maybe start, you can then compliment. So, um, yeah, I, 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 maybe I tried also to, to uh, emphasize that. I think the, the first, first step from my very personal opinion uh, would be to have a very in-depth uh, analysis uh, on how urbanization patterns are uh, here in Lithuania. So actually also international in different countries where we work, that's actually the first step uh, that we do. It depends, of course, if you have this analysis here, uh, yes or not. In some countries they have overanalyzed already, so it also don't help. But actually uh, to have an understanding, as I mentioned before, um, how cities work, since we are focusing mainly uh, on cities, as I'm repeating myself, to understand what's the legal framework, what are the mandates, I have learned that you have now also the, the election of the mayor just recently, like two years ago, to understand really actually what is the legal framework under which uh, cities are, uh, are operating. I think that's really for me the, the forefront, uh, I, a deep analysis. Also how the fiscal dis um, the decentralization laws exist to know um, if cities depend here more uh, on national transfers, uh, uh, transfers or how is the ratio from the national transfer to the, their own uh, revenues, um, is there a potential to increase their own revenues, how do they gather their own revenues. Uh, so that's actually a very uh, important analysis, it's just not pulling up figures, so also trying to match them together. Uh, national transfers, are they coming on time? Are they coming maybe half a year later? Half a year la later means that the city actually can't plan because uh, they're settled up a plan, but, but the finance is coming um, later uh, onwards. So actually I think that's a very important uh, uh, exercise. I would personally look uh, very strongly into the Agenda 2030s and the new urban agenda not necessarily because we have to report or not to report against them. I think it gives you a very good uh, overview how different man matters in uh, relation to sustainable development in general outside of the cities, how they are linked. And when you will come also to the understanding that actually most of the, the current challenges which we face, and it doesn't matter if it's increasing or decreasing, is uh, actually uh, faced uh, in cities. So I think that would be like um, my, my very first uh, entry point. The second aspect, uh, I, I would have a closer look to see how the curriculum works as well, how many, uh, what I showed the, the, the graphic as well, is how uh, the cities are um, um, 
uh, how do you say it, uh, how many uh, human resources the, the city have, not only the financial, but actually who is working in the city. So what is their background? Are that's professionals? I'm also repeating, but I think it's very important. So you can't run a city if you have only support staff, which is important, but you have to have somebody uh, doing energy or transport, somebody environment, depends of course, again, of the mandate. Uh, planners, you have to have somebody who is looking into gender, so actually, do you have really the, the staff in place who can run the, 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 the city? So actually, you have to see who is supporting the curriculum and actually is the curriculum, is it also in line with the challenges? What are the planners actually learning? Is it still up to date or also maybe out, outdated? Just maybe to keep it uh, into these uh, two points uh, as a first entry point to, to uh, understand. And then the third point maybe what we do is try really to develop, and I haven't had a chance to look here uh, into the local plans. If you have local plans, how long are the long-term plans? Do you have long-term or short-term plans? Do they uh, also have uh, trends that you see how cities are, are growing or decreasing? So just maybe to, to leave it there. Um, Robert Zarngis would like to add or? Sure, yeah. Čia geras klausimas ir aš jau grįšiu prie to, ką esu nekartą siūlęs, kad visų pirma reikia turbūt savivaldai suteikti realias galės, ką ir kalbėjo ir mūsų kalbėjo, reiškia, aš nekovai. Nes aš, pavyzdžiui, labai gražiai pasiklausiau apie tą pavyzdį šalia Mančesterio, kad žmonės paėmė ir pradėjo miestą keisti, reiškia, sodindami medžius, vais medžius ir augalus įvairius, kurie yra naudinki žmogui. Ir man pirma mintis atėjo, ar nacionalinė žemės tarnyba leistų tą daryti. Turbūt mieste būtų uždrausta iš karto. Tai reiškia, kad pirmas dalykas ir turbūt svarbiausias, kad žmonės įgautų realią galę savo mieste. Ir tam reikia šiandien pertvarkyti ir biudžeto formavimo įstatymą, dėl to, kad šiandien savivalda neturi galių finansinių veikti į mieste, jūs turbūt nežinot, kad naujam biudžeto įstatyme, naujam, kuris dabar eina Seime, savivaldai leista yra skolintis tik tai skolų padengimui. Kitaip tariant, jeigu savivaldybė pati sugalvos kažkokius projektus, kurie realiai naudingi savivaldai, tarkim, investuoti pinigus miesto tam, kad auginti, reiškia, investicijas, tarkim, miestas negali skolinti. Kiek man teko dabar išskaityti naujam biudžeto projekte, tai vėl, ar tai yra laisvė veikti, tai aišku, nėra laisvė veikti. Kitas labai svarbus klausimas, ką mes išleidė, esam iš akiračio, tai mūsų visa ta sistema priežiūros valstybei. Kodėl jinai yra tokia, reiškia, sunkia judanti? Dėl paprasto dalyko. Mūsų priežiūrinėm įstaigom trūksta kompetencijos. Ir aš drąsiai galiu tą sakyti, dėl tos prieš ties, kad esu susidūrę su skandinaviška priežiūrinė sistema ir ten žmogus, pas kurį tu ateini savivaldybėj spręsti klausimo, tarkim, statyvos, renovacijos ar kažko mieste daryti, jis turi pakankamai kompetencijos ir galiu pasakyti tau iš kartą atsakymą. Jūs man parodikit miestą Lietuvoje, kur galima taip gauti iš kartą atsakymą. Minimum bus, reiškia, komitetas, minimum bus, reiškia, tarybos posėdis, bus sudaryta ekspertų komisija, kuri tris mėnesius spręsta ir iš vis tą klausimą reikia spręsti. Tai mūsų problema yra ta, kad mes susibirokratinom visą sistemą iki neįgalėjimo ir po to, reiškia, mes pasiklydom egzekiutinime, vykdime visų tų reikalų. Dėl to, Šiandien Lietuvoje taip ilgai trunka procesai. Vilniui detalų planą padaryti reikia dviejų metų. Per du metus pasikeičia ekonominį situaciją. Ir iš esmės, reiškia, jeigu mes kalbam apie konkurencingumą šiandien, jeigu mes kalbam apie žmonių pritraukimą arba jų išlaikymą, tai be efektyviai veikiančio savildos, kuri turi galės, kuri turi instrumentus, kuri turi tą specialistų lygį pakankamą, spręsti tos klausimus, Ta savivaldybė praktiškai yra be ateities. Jeigu to nebus, nieko ir nebus. Tai man atrodo, ką daryti mes žinom, bet šiandien man atrodo tas užsipolitikavimas, tas sulindimas į, reiškia, biurokratinių džiunglių statymą, tai yra Lietuvos ateičiai girnapuose ant kaklo ir ant kojų.
Um, Very few uh, things to add to that. Um, absolutely agree that, of course, local cities and municipalities need to be empowered because you can only empower citizens if you're already empowered as, as a local authority to do so. So that's, that's very clear. I think the next thing is to, uh, picking up on um, what you said, you have to also empower people across the local authority to make things happen. Right? And a lot of designers, a lot of planners, a lot of um, people in municipalities, for example, in the Netherlands or in, uh, or in the UK, so this is not particularly a comment on Lithuania, it's, it's a general thing, feel that their role is to control things, right? that they need to prevent bad things from happening. Actually, in most cities, and certainly in declining cities and, and smaller places, the most important thing is often to make new things happen. Now, that's a philosophical shift. You need to, you need to turn the organization of the city council, of the municipality, into an organization that enables new things to happen. And if you set your mind to that, you probably um, have a very different culture in your organization. You probably want to empower everyone in the organization to make connections between people. Uh, so the important thing that, a, that a, a planner does is not necessarily occupy themselves with, with databases or, or, or maps or plans, but actually, if there's a developer who wants to do something with an old building, just an example, um, the point is often, well, maybe they can work together with a citizen's group, right? So don't try and, and uh, 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 you know, slap uh, the developer on the head with these are the rules, this is what you can't do, etc. But here's someone you should talk to, to make your project even better. Or if you need finance, maybe this organization can work, or maybe you can do a crowdfunding raise together. So it's about enabling new networks um, to exist. And then the last um, point on that is um, you need to also, as a city council, I think, be very visible, so politically and, uh, and in the everyday life, visible towards your citizens that new ideas are welcome, that new ideas are desired. So opening, uh, descending, uh, uh, go out of the city hall, open a shop front as a kind of shop window for new ideas. Where, where and, and we've done this in London, and it's transformative. You put a few people from, from the municipality r right amongst the public to talk about what it is they'd love to see happen and how you could make that happen. And, and give yourself the challenge, if a citizen has an idea, to put them on the road towards developing it within three weeks. You know, just kind of immediately connect them, help them to create a website, help them to raise something. Maybe you should create in your city a small fund a, a, the tiniest possible fund for new ideas, for innovation. Um, and maybe local developers might be really uh, excited to contribute to that, right? Put a small bit of public money, try and leverage that with a bit of private uh, money, because what we've seen in the Netherlands is that developers are often very much willing to work with local creatives and local entrepreneurs to make things happen, because developers benefit, right, from, from an increase in value generated through, um, through citizen initiative. And then all the whilst you're doing that, the visible stuff, uh, the, this highly visible experimental stuff, you need to look into the systems that sit behind it, right? What you were saying, uh, and, and really look at your databases and all that kind of stuff. But so, so there's a twin track approach. One is highly visible, shifting the culture, and then there is the, the, the deeper, slower change of, of finance and data and that full stack that I mentioned beneath that. And you need to do both at the same time. Bert, would like to add? Maybe, maybe one, one example which is also, again, positive uh, from the, the experience uh, of the municipality in, uh, of Vilnius. They um, would like to promote uh, the, uh, the growth of cycling as part of the uh, uh, transport mix, uh, which is, uh, let's say, a, a steep task because it's about 0.5% of the total traffic. So there's a task. I've seen it happening in Budapest uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the mass movement of, uh, uh, um, let's say, within three years, uh, it was possible to uh, totally change the landscape of that metropolis uh, in terms of creating a, uh, a cycling uh, atmosphere. So it is possible. But what uh, the municipality has done is to create a point at, uh, at their website in which um, 
citizens could actually uh, complain about the cycling infrastructure. And they did. Uh, about 600 points were uh, noted, uh, they were checked, uh, people are working on it, it's about half of, as far as I was informed, half of the uh, bottlenecks have been solved or at least something has been done about it. But this is a kind of an interactive attitude of uh, a municipality uh, which I'd like to see. Uh, and maybe uh, if I'm allowed uh, further comment on, let's say, the, the character of uh, public administration, um, I find sometimes uh, that um, there is a, a lot of hierarchy, a lot of um, uh, hesitation to delegate to uh, people who are actually on, uh, on the working floor, so to speak. Um, uh, I think that if, if um, let's, say the, um, let's say, municipal authorities um, at, at a higher level would trust their um, uh, support staff, uh, let's say the ones who are uh, uh, confronted with the requests or uh, questions uh, by the individual citizens and they have at, at least the authority to say something uh, uh, definitively to their uh, customers, it would change the, the whole attitude towards the municipal uh, authorities immediately. And we're talking about the, uh, the general trend uh, this is what was called the dark matter. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the idea people have about authority. We are also looking at it from, let's say, a different point of view as an embassy. How accessible are you? Are you um, transparent? Are you responsive um, and accountable? Those kind of things should be part and parcel of your attitude. Um, we, we are all public servants, and this, this kind of a notion should be taken very seriously at every level. So give trust to the people who actually do the job, uh, lead by looking at uh, the big lines, but that's it. Just yeah. don't try to control everything. So um, uh, we're almost running out of time. And, um, can, I, can I still add some comments on that? Just, just yeah. a second. Uh, on a final note, uh, since we have a lot of, let's say, uh, decision makers, policy makers, uh, municipality, executive, and so on, what would be your one advice that they could do uh, real quick and that would have uh, immediate results? What would be one thing that they could just go back and do on Monday and then have results by Friday, let's say? <laughs> is there such thing? Or maybe, maybe like a shift in mentality is already good enough? I would go back one question, if, if you allow me. <laughs> because uh, just a personal experience that I, uh, <clears throat> about the, the perception of public administration. I was working for a year in uh, New York's planning department and the perception of public service in, in, in New York was awful. Everybody saw it as a very slow, very heavy bureaucratic mechanism seen from the private sector. When I left, it was completely different, and it was not because of me, but it was because there was a mayor who put a lot of energy into making pu public service sexy and very attractive. They brought in good people, but also they made everything look interesting and attractive and just changed completely the communication. And we don't have to go to New York for this. The city of Prague, for example, is completely has re uh, rebranded its planning uh, department. They, they opened a space, one of like something similar to what I showed, a space where everybody can understand what's pl what planning is, what's, what, are, what, what we as a public administration are working on. They create materials, brochures, which are comprehensible to human beings. So this is a very big step, start, starting to explain what we do and what are the, the moments when people can actually enter and join in and contribute to. And this is a big part in communication. Also another thing, if you go to, um, to Amsterdam, there's a place which is called the Packhaus des Vakher, which is an event space, which is similar to what we do here, but it happens there every day. And this is a place where you no longer have to insist for public administration to come. They will come because they can learn. So to create an atmosphere, create spaces, create occasions where people know that they don't go there because they get credits or they get, uh, I don't know, they get a photo. But they go because they learn and it's important to learn. I think this is a very important uh, to create as an atmosphere. And one advice? 
Well, I guess it's, it's start creating uh, kind of a, um, maybe a committee where you have different stakeholders on board and who can contribute to decision making. Make, make a committee today. Um, on Monday, <laughs> I think um, th the most visible thing you can do um, and, and the most transformative for your organization is, is, I think, open a little space which looks funky and which is unlike any municipal space um, uh, that currently exists uh, in a place where there's lots of people. And every day or every week you send a different part of your municipal organization into that space to have conversations with citizens about what it is they'd love to do in their city as citizens. And you'll learn a lot, and the first weeks people will just complain, uh, but after a while, and, and, and maybe you need to have some ex inspiring examples of what's going on elsewhere in the world, but after a while people will understand uh, both, both the public and in your organization what it is to collaborate, collaborate on the future of your place uh, uh, together. And then, of course, all the complexity about, w about what that really means in terms of long-term planning and being comfortable with open-endedness and finance, etc. That will follow. But first, you need to show that you're open and you need to learn what it is to be open. Alexandra. So now it's actually difficult because they mentioned it already. So but I actually, I, I think then I don't have to mention something new because since it's Friday and you have to implement it on Monday, uh, so you have results next Friday, I would go in the, same, in the same line, because if not, it would be analysis data that takes too much uh, time. So actually what you what could uh, have an impact in five days, I would also agree. I would uh, see without knowing what of participation mechanisms you have here, but maybe to open up uh, the space, invite different urban stakeholders, maybe even feedback also what we have heard here, some aspects which you would like uh, to share with them and then also to try to have a more regular meetings with civil society, with urban stakeholders, and, and to try to map out what the priorities. So totally in line, and I think that's actually the most uh, important first step. Robert, are you? Tavis, all I guess, how the auxiny spelulis is coimas. I think that maybe 27 years ago, no one did it. Uflyt the organism, rukyti, gerti, nesportuoti. Ir kada pasijauti blogai, nuėni pas gydytojų ir laukia, kad tau duos kažkokią auksinę tabletę, kad turi to atsikelsi sveikas, sportiškas ir geras. Nėra tokių tablečių. Yra labai sunkus kelias, lygiai taip pat vėl, jeigu nori grįžti. Ir koks tas pirmas žingsnis būtų? Tai aš vis tiek žiūriu labai pozityviai į jaunimą miestuose. Ir ypatingai turbūt į juos žiūriu su ta viltim, kad tai yra Lietuvos ateitės. Ir jeigu šiandien dienai ką daryčiau pirmadienį, tai pakviešiau miesto jaunimą ir sakyti, kurkim savo miestą. Ir jūs pamatysit, kaip per kelias dienas atsiras naujų idėjų, ką galima daryti kitaip, kaip galima miestą padaryti tokį, kurios kuriam jiems būtų gera gyventi ateitį. Mr. Ambassador. Well, I, I, I guess uh, we are quite, uh, let's say, in unison, because uh, my, my comment would have been uh, uh, open your town hall for a town hall meeting with your citizens uh, immediately um, and make sure that you, uh, you listen to what people have to say indeed. They will complain first. Uh, there, there are lots of uh, things that need to be done. But the positive thing is, uh, immediate effect is that people feel themselves heard. Yeah. And uh, let them uh, take the city, uh, uh, make them the city of their, their own. Uh, make them co-owners, co-responsible for, uh, let's say, the, the, the vividness of uh, their own community. Thank you very much. And on this note, I would like to thank the participants of our panel discussion, uh, Levente Polak from uh, Utropian, uh, Joost Bonderman from Zero Zero, uh, Alexandra Kür from uh, Cities Alliance, Robert Asdergis, the president of Lithuanian Industrials Association, and uh, Mr. Ambassador Bert van der Lingen. Thank you very much.
Round of applause.